to call the July 28th, 2015 Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board, Board of Appeals meeting to order. Um, the first order of business is to approve the minutes of the June 23rd, 2015 meeting. Move to approve the uh, minutes for the June 23rd, 2015 meeting. Actually, can I make one quick correction if it hasn't already been made? On page five, line two, we correct foul to F O U L. It's no harm in a foul as in the bird. Nice catch. Is that a friendly amendment? Yes, <laughs> Um, with uh, that revision, any second? Uh, any discussion? All right, all in favor? All right, the June 23rd, 2015 minutes are approved, five nothing. Uh, there is no old business before the board, so we'll move right on to the new business. Um, the first order of new business is to hear the request of Leslie Fismer, owner of the property at 20 Connor Lane, to appeal the code enforcement officer's decision to approve building permit number 150401 for a new single family dwelling at 19 Connor Lane, map U14, lot 26-1. Good evening. My name is John Schumadine. I'm an attorney at Murray Plum Murray. And I'm here to represent Leslie Fismer, who is the appellant in this action. Ms. Fismer owns property that abuts the uh, project for which the building permit was granted and uh, I think has shown particularized injury in that uh, the building once constructed will obstruct her view. So therefore we believe we have standing to maintain this appeal. Now with that said, we've filed a letter that outlines our argument here tonight. And I think most of what's in the letter is pretty self-explanatory. So I don't want to necessarily go through every single point all over again, but I have a couple of high, high points that I do want to touch on. And of course, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, but before I get into the stuff that I submitted, the first thing I want to talk about is something that the applicant submitted. And that is the supposed settlement agreement that he's relying on in order to attempt to prevent this appeal. And uh, the applicant uh, has provided you a number of drafts of the settlement agreement, various things indicating a history of negotiations and things like that. But what he hasn't provided for you is a signed copy. Because I don't think a signed copy exists. My client did not sign the agreement. She doesn't think anyone signed the agreement. Uh, she thinks that, as far as I'm aware, there is no settlement agreement. It never existed. I will agree that if you look at these things and you read through it, it it's kind of a head scratcher as to what might have happened here. Because it certainly seems like people were, you know, posturing, you've got to sign this thing or we're not going to dismiss the lawsuit and various stuff like that. And then the lawsuit did get dismissed. But there's no signed agreement. And that's ultimately what I come down to, is that there is no signed agreement you can't enforce the signed agreement until you can, you can't enforce the agreement until you show that the other side actually agreed to it. There isn't an agreement, so there's nothing to enforce here. Um, and I think that's a pretty simple point and a, an important one to consider here. The second point about it is that even if there were a signed agreement, the, signed, the uh, drafts that we have say that it becomes void, it becomes completely void as soon as the trustees, which was the applicant's predecessor in title, uh, abandons the public access waiver. And I provide you a letter from the applicant, from David Smith, who at the time owned the property. The letter is not dated, but I don't think there's any dispute as to the timing of the letter in that the, t the letter was filed, written after Mr. Smith owned the property, after whatever settlement agreement was negotiated and done after the conveyance and after the public access waiver was granted. And although it uses the word subdivision in it, I don't think there's any way you can read it, because there was no subdivision. The only thing that was in existence at the time is the public access waiver. And he says he abandons it. So I think even if the settlement agreement existed, by its plain terms, it does not bar this appeal. 
And that actually brings me to the last point about the settlement agreement, and the one I think is most crucial here. And that is, it is a settlement agreement. If there's anyone who's going to enforce it, it's got to be a court of law. It's not the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals exists to interpret the ordinance, determine whether the provisions of the ordinance are met or not, and that's it. It's not in the business of enforcing private agreements between parties like this supposed settlement agreement, even if it existed. I think it didn't exist, so I don't think you need to go there. I think it's just, it basically should be considered a non-issue in this case. Ignore it and move on to the, to the merits of the case, which involved whether the building permit was properly issued or not. And I suggest to you that it was not. Uh, and I think the reason why it was not was twofold. One is, and the code enforcement officer didn't know about this, but the abandonment. I mean, I've shown you a letter, I've shown you a letter from the applicant, or the applicant's, uh, the, the owner of the property, which is basically the same thing. And if you look at the letter, it indicates that they are abandoning the subdivision, which means the public access waiver, I don't think you can read it any other way. And that the two lots are now one. So that, to me, just as a starting point, means the public access waiver doesn't exist anymore, and therefore they have to go into the current ordinance. I think even, so, so that, that's the first hurdle they've got to get over, and I don't think they can. Even if they get over that hurdle, though, they then have the problem of what the public access waiver is. And I've given you the provision that the public access waiver comes from in the old ordinance, the one that was enacted, or active at the time that they were applying for this thing. And if you look at it, the way it, it, it writes, or reads rather, is to get a building permit, you have to first have access on a public road. That's the first requirement. But then it has this public access waiver provision. So what it's doing is it's saying, OK, if you don't have a public road, we've provided you another way to go and, and show that you have the access necessary for the issuance of a building permit. And that's what they got here. So what it is, it's all a part of a procedure that was enacted for how you get a building permit under the old ordinance. They did the first part. They didn't do the second part, which is to get a building permit. He didn't divide the property until 2010. He didn't ask for a building permit until this year, 2015. By the time he did all of that, all of this procedure in the ordinance was gone. So he never went to the point where he actually got the approval that this public access waiver was saying he needed to get was the first precursor towards getting. So therefore, the thing just doesn't exist anymore as of the time the ordinance gets changed. And because there was no division of the property until 2010, there are no vested rights, there's no way to get around it, the thing just is gone. I mean, it would be different if in 1997 he'd gotten the public access waiver, gotten the building permit, and then just sort of hung around for a while and didn't do anything except make, maybe make a substantial start or something to give him vested rights. Because then, even though the ordinance has changed, he's changed his position in reliance on the ordinance. And that's how you get vested rights. Here, there's no change in position. The, the lots, there's supposedly two, start out in 1997 as one lot from Monks. Monks comes, gets a public access waiver. It still remains one lot. Monks then sells it to David Smith. It remains one lot. And then in 2010, for the first time, it gets divided into two lots. And at that point, the new section of the ordinance applied. So what that all means is, is that in order to show that, uh, in order for the applicant to show that he's entitled to a building permit under this ordinance, he has to meet the new one. And the new one has two requirements. We don't dispute the first one, which is a showing that the road is adequate for fire and emergency access. We know that that one's been met. We don't really have a dispute about that one. The second one, though, requires a showing of a legally enforceable maintenance agreement. There is no such legally enforceable maintenance agreement, at least if you look at what's required under the ordinance, there's none in the record that would show such a, that would be sufficient to satisfy that standard. What is in the record is a maintenance agreement with one person in it, which is David Smith, that only applies to the portion of the road that abuts his property. Now, I looked through the materials, and I found a map, which is 
uh, attached to my letter, it's just before, it's the last page of Exhibit A, and it looks like this. And the point of this is that the property is right here. You can see. The public road system is up here on the top. And Connor Lane stretches from here down to his property. Now, the maintenance agreement only applies to the property that abuts David Smith's property, the, the portion of the road that abuts David Smith's property, which means it applies to this portion of the road and not to this portion. Now, I think that if you look at that provision in the ordinance, there's only one way really to read it. And what they're saying is, you need to show us that you have a way, a legally enforceable way, to maintain the entirety of the roads so that you continue to have access to the public roads for eternity after you've built this house. That's what's required. That's the type of, of legally enforceable maintenance agreement that has to be shown in, this, in order for this type of this provision, the current provision under the ordinance, to uh, apply and for him to show that he's met it. He does not have any, any legally enforceable maintenance agreement that covers the entire portion of Cunner Lane from the public road system to his property. He only has for half of the road as it abuts his property. Now there is there are informal agreements to maintain Cutter Lane and it has been maintained, but that's all informal. That's not legally enforceable, and that's what your ordinance reads, that it's legally enforceable. Without showing that, he can't show that he's entitled to the building permit and therefore the building permit was issued in error. And that's the base uh, the gist of our argument. So unless there are any, any questions or? Any questions at this time? OK. Thanks. My name is Alan Atkins. I represent David Smith. We are here to challenge the opposition by Leslie Fesma to the issuance of his building permit. I think it critical to start off by pointing out that Mrs. Fisma does not have standing to be here to object. The, there was a case identical to this fact pattern. In the, United, the main Supreme Judicial Court has held that the abutters do not have standing to maintain their action based on her same claim. Specifically, the court stated, in terms of evidentiary propriety, the potential for obstruction of view as an improper subject for judicial notice. Whether a structure, when constructed, will obstruct the abutter's view sufficiently to rise to the level of a particularized in in injury is clearly neither a matter of uncontested common knowledge nor capable of certain verification. That's the case of Hunt Harrington versus the town of Kennebunk, and I have copies for it if you uh, would like to read that case. Under this rule, Mrs. Fisma does not have standing. And under other circumstances, this matter should stop right now. But it's, I'll continue. Mrs. Fisma attempts to revisit the validity of the public, offer, public access waiver granted to the Monks Trust in 1997. Under the rule of Crosby versus the town of Belgrade, the issuance of the validity of a public access waiver is subject to administrative collateral estoppel. There was a public hearing, a vote, and written findings provided by the planning board, as well as an ADB appeal to the Superior Court by the Snows, abutting neighbors of Mrs. Fisma. Fisma's attempt to revisit the issue comes over 15 years too late, as she could have attended the public hearing or joined the Snows in an appeal of the approval of the public access waiver in 1997. Did she attend the public hearing? If so, why did she not join the Snows in opposition? Uh, that is something that's got to be taken into consideration. She had her opportunity. Mrs. Fismer attempts to treat the public access waiver as a building permit. 
These are two distinct issues and are treated so both under the zoning ordinance as it existed in 1997 and as it exists today. The public access waiver does not expire. There is nothing in the ordinance that says it does. If this were a building permit, then we have six months. There is a specific limitation on it there, not here. Under the rule of the Somer case, the Cape, Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance did not explicitly state that a public access waiver or private access way is to have a limited duration, and the zoning ordinance does not contain that language. Part of the history of this case involved the Monks Trust. They were the prior owners of the land purchased by Mr. Smith in 1998. Prior to the sale of the property to Mr. Smith in January 1998, the Monks Trust went through the process of obtaining a public access waiver from the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board under 1942 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance to split the property into two lots. Obtaining a public access waiver under 1942 required certain criteria be met, along with requirements including emergency access and road maintenance covenants. In your packet, we submitted a copy of the road maintenance agreement. That agreement was drafted by the town, signed by, the, by Mr. Smith under the auspices of the then Bruce Smith, the code enforcement officer. The public hearing that was held allowed Mrs. Fismer to express her concerns over the public access waiver. By a vote of four to two by the planning board, the public access waiver was granted in February 1997 because it complied with the zoning ordinance. The town of Cape Elizabeth has recognized the property as map lot number U1426, the larger lot, and U1426-1 is the smaller lot. This was done for tax purposes. The Snows brought an 880B appeal against the town and the Monks Trust challenged the issuance of the building permit and the division of the property. The action was dismissed with prejudice by the parties, relinquishing the right to raise that issue again. There are suggestions that Mrs. Fismer was part of a settlement agreement. There were two versions of the settlement agreement. Her name appeared on both. I do not have a copy of a signed settlement agreement. I must admit she may not have signed it, but she was certainly part of the negotiations that led to that. <clears throat> Mr. Smith, through counsel, contacted the code enforcement officer early in 2010 to confirm the public access waiver was valid. The code enforcement officer confirmed the validity of the public access waiver granted to the Monks Trust and added that Mr. Smith would have to be in compliance with the current code section of the zoning ordinance. That's 1979. In reliance on the correspondence with the code enforcement officer and the public access waiver, Mr. Smith conveyed out lot, the smaller lot, U1426-1, on April 20, 2010, <clears throat> and then he took the necessary steps to be in compliance with the current zoning ordinance. There was never a waiver of any notification of the code enforcement officer that the public access waiver had expired, and neither is there any language in the ordinance stating that the public access waiver expired. Uh, Mr. Schumerdein has made a lot of a letter that Mr. Smith wrote to Mr. Snow. That letter was merely an expression of kindness from one neighbor to another, they had a tense relationship because of the ADB appeal. Mr. Smith wanted to assure Mr. Snow that he had no immediate plans of building on the lot. I don't know how Mrs. Fisma got a copy of that letter. She's not a party to the letter. I don't think she has any right to rely on it or to submit it to you for any consideration. Uh, the letter's a friendly letter, one neighbor to another. That was, and Mr. Snow is now gone, he's left the property, and uh, that letter just simply doesn't have the evidentiary value. Even if you were to consider it, it's hearsay. So based on all of that, I uh, hope that you will uphold the permit being issued, and I think that's my presentation at this point. And I'm open to any questions you may have. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I guess I'd just like to respond to a couple of the points that were made. Um, I'll try to go through them in order. First one is standing. I heard two words in the quote 
that he gave to you that I think are crucial? And the words were judicial notice. He said, the imposition or uh, diminishment of a view is not something that the court can take judicial notice of. And in fact, if you listen to the rest of the quote, it's all talking about the standards of what things there are that the court can take judicial notice of. Now, I don't have the case in front of me, but I basically would infer from that 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 means that what the court was saying was, you've said that you have standing and you're raising view for the first time on appeal and you're asking us to take judicial notice that it's impacting our view and we can't, I can't, the court's saying that it cannot do so. I think there are cases out there that say the obstruction of a view is sufficient to confer standing. Uh, but if it is not, I think that we are also, because we are so close to the property, we are right across the street, Ms. Fismer will suffer injuries from the construction, from the noise, from the dust, and uh, everything else that's attendant with the construction of this building. And secondly, I think you should recall that the building, I believe, is 150 feet wide. Uh, so it is an enormous building. It will obstruct view. I think there's no Ar there can be no factually based argument that it will not. And I believe that that's sufficient in and of itself under the very low hurdle there exists to confer standing, to confer standing in this case. Uh, the idea that the administrative collateral estoppel applies in this case, I think it, it just doesn't. Uh, administrative collateral estoppel would only apply, well, first of all, she wasn't a party to the initial action. Uh, usually you have to be a party to have something come held against you. There's no indication that she was a party to the initial action, so therefore the whole concept of collateral estoppel and judicial estoppel just simply do not apply. And the second point is, is that it, it, it doesn't really address the central issues here, which is, does this provision still have any validity in today, under today's ordinance, given that nothing was ever done on it for 15 years? or at least 10 years, until he, uh, 10 years until he divided the property. And I suggest that he doesn't. The cases that uh, Attorney Atkins cited, talking about permitting that has no expiration date means that that permit lasts forever, those cases all talk about things like subdivision. They talk about a permitting process that is complete as of the time it is done. You get a subdivision, you're done. You're not going and you're not doing anything else. That's not what this public access waiver is. If you look at the old ordinance, this public access waiver is intertwined with the process for getting a building permit. I think the idea that a public access waiver was meant to survive for all time just is belied by the structure and, and function and form of the old zoning ordinance. And I think it just doesn't, doesn't hold weight here. And I think ultimately, though, uh, we come down to <coughs> problem of the letter. The letter that shows that he abandoned it. Now, I know Attorney Atkins just said that it was not something Ms. Fismer should rely on. Said something about hearsay, uh, which doesn't apply in this uh, proceeding since the standard for administrative proceedings is evidence upon which reasonable people would rely. Even if it did apply, it's an admission by a party opponent and therefore is under the rules of evidence defined as not hearsay. So therefore that just doesn't apply. But I think also it's important to understand the context of this letter. If you read the entire paragraph that's relevant here, Mr. Smith says, I am writing to you simply because you are the only person with whom I have had contact there as related to the past development of the property and since others supported you in that effort, I presume that you probably all know each other. By the way, you will be pleased to know the subdivision approved by the town has been abandoned and two properties have been rejoined into one parcel. I don't know how to read that except to Mr. Snow. I'm giving you this letter. Show it to everyone. You're the one, you're my contact here with all the neighbors. This should go to everyone. So the idea that we shouldn't be able to rely on it is a little strange since the letter itself indicates that we should rely on it because it was intended to be dispersed to everyone. And ultimately, you know, it says that he is abandoning the, the subdivision, the public access waiver. It doesn't say I'm not building right now because he could have said that. In fact, most people, if they say, you know, hey, I know we had this dispute. I'm, I'm probably going to be building, but you should just know that I'm not building right at the moment. That's what they're going to say. They're not going to say, I am abandoning the subdivision.
because those words have meaning. I mean, words, abandonment is a pretty big, big word that has a certain meaning. Mr. Smith is a smart man. He should be held to the words that he has used. But ultimately, I think you don't even need, I mean, I think there's so many other problems with this public access waiver, as I've laid out, that you have to find that it just does not exist anymore. Uh, and that he has to comply under the current ordinance, and he can't, at least not as of right now, and therefore you have to reverse the issuance of the building permit. Okay. over this letter truly mystifies me. It's almost 20 years later. What is unusual about one person going to a neighbor, trying to make amends, trying to overcome some ill will that might have developed over a lawsuit? Uh, I think in this community it's what we expect of people who live near each other and hopefully avoid some of the contentious arguments that seem to gravitate to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Mr. Snow's not here. I wasn't around when the letter was written. I was Mr. Schumadine. But Mr. Smith is. He came to this hearing because this is important to him. And I think uh, would you be kind enough to give him a moment to explain what he meant when he wrote that letter. There's nothing about the public access waiver in it. Abandoned, abandoned legally has to have more than just a statement, I'm abandoning something. There has to be an action based upon it. Uh, he's not a lawyer. He's a successful businessman, but he's not a lawyer. And like a lot of us, when he takes his hat off for the day and he goes home, he speaks like all of us. And the word abandoned to him did not carry with it, nor was it meant to carry with it, the meaning that Mr. Schumann would like to attach to it. He certainly didn't take a piece of property that was worth almost $2 million and say, I'm going to give it up. What he meant to say was that he's not going to develop it today. Don't worry about it. It may be tomorrow, it may be a year, maybe 10 years down the road, but you don't have to worry about it today. And I, I hope you will bear that in mind. And uh, David, would you like to kind of uh, By way of some background, uh, in, in order to I think maybe for historic purposes, give you some perspective of my involvement in this process. In 1997, I came to Cape Elizabeth and was shown this piece of property. I knew nothing about it other than, based on the brochure that I was given, put together by town and shore, it said very matter-of-factly, it is a subdivided lot and you can build two houses on that. I think such a deal. All right. Based on what I had been advised that the lots were worth in the neighborhood, let alone what the value of the front lot, which is five acres, is worth, I looked at it as a real estate transaction and said, I literally said to my realtor, I said, is there something wrong with this property? Is there a toxic dump next to it or something? Because just the pricing of this is something wrong. So I literally, when I first saw the property from at the end of Hannaford Cove, I said to my realtor, have you looked at the brochure, recognizing it was subdivided already and I could build a second home on there? I said, I'm buying the property site unseen. This is where I can build a second home for my kids. So the evolution of the transaction was, I literally within 24, 48 hours signed a contract for the property. Engaged Alan to come in and represent me. Nothing tricky. During the pendency of the window of time from the time I signed the contract to the time I closed, which was December 30th, I think, was the proposed close date. I became aware of some litigation on the property as part of a title search or Allen advising me or whatever. <clears throat> so obviously I chatted with Allen, what's the issue about the litigation? Well, the issue was somebody doesn't want the property developed, so what's already been approved by the township, so what's the issue? As far as he was concerned, 
There was no legal basis to, for anybody to overturn the thing. So I literally said, well, I need to go talk to Mr. Smoke, so Mr. Snow since he was the moving party in this thing and let me have a chat with him. So again, we're going back 17 years. I'm pushing 65, so we're going to test my memory a little bit. I suspect I had a conversation with Mr. Snow that kind of went like this. I understand you have a problem with the property. You don't want to see it developed. I understand you got some litigation against the seller, the Monk Estate. You should know that I intend to buy the property with the litigation. You're not going to stop me from buying the property, period, end of the discussion. So if you want to fight, your fight's going to be transferred from the Monk family to me, and I'm prepared to take that on if need be. That was the last time we had that conversation about the property. I closed on the property a couple of days later. A few weeks later, he chose, with no further conversation with me, to drop the litigation of his own accord. I was not privy to any of the negotiations that were going on between Mr. Snow, et al., or the Fismer family. Et al. had nothing to do with that. Wasn't aware of that until literally a few weeks ago when Alan said there were settlement discussions going on. That's very interesting. So sometime during the evolution of the development of, the, of my house, which, which is simply I decided to gut the inside of the entire house, it was about a year project. Wright Ryan got the contract to do it, and we started. During that process, I wrote a letter. First of all, I became aware by virtue of a survey that I had done. And the survey said that the Hunter Lane, as it currently constituted, turns out is riding directly over the property that I just acquired. So I said, well, that's interesting. So when you read the letter that I wrote to Doug, I think it was Doug, You'll see in the first paragraph of the letter, it says, Doug, in the process of preparing for the building of my stone wall around the perimeter of the property, I've learned that Connery Lane is actually on my property by a significant amount. So I said, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to have a conversation about that and how we're going to deal with that issue. Subsequent to that, in the next paragraph that seems to be an interesting subject of discussion, I totally gratuitously said to Doug, you don't have to worry about anything my kids aren't of age, I'm not going to develop the property tomorrow. Wasn't too long after that, he picked up and left. Moved to Florida, did whatever he did, and actually a friend of mine bought the house from Denver. So the, the whole letter was nothing more than a gratuitous comment to reduce friction between him and me. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no mention of access waiver or, or waiver process. I don't even know what the waiver process is today. It has absolutely no meaning to me. It's a legal thing that Alan dealt with. So the notion that somehow I would abandon a property that was worth millions of dollars is absurd at the least. There's no chance that was going to happen. So the reality is nothing more than, Doug, don't worry about it. My kids were young at the time, really young. I had no plans on doing anything until they were of age where I could turn it over to them. So I view the whole conversation about the letter, at least that aspect of the letter, is completely gratuitous with no meaning whatsoever. You can describe whatever you want and attempt to, but the fact of the matter is, as far as I'm concerned, it had no meaning, and absolutely nothing. And the fact of the matter is, Alan, who was representing me, applied to the township to do nothing. We did nothing as a function of that letter. We didn't go to the township and say, let's unwind everything that Mr. Monk just did and his estate just did for the last year or so. We did absolutely nothing. So. My conclusion is it's nothing more than a gratuitous comment to quiet him down and say, don't worry about it, I'm not doing anything tomorrow. If I was going to turn it in, first of all, if I was going to do anything and abandon it, I would have donated it to the Environmental Trust. That would have been the first thing I'd have done if I was completely interested in not, not development. I didn't do that because I always plan to develop it. The only issue is at what point in time in history when my kids are old enough to be a beneficiary in the development, that's all. So that's kind of the sum and substance of my history with the property and the meaning of the words abandoned. I didn't abandon anything. The one thing I did do was interesting that maybe you could describe as abandoned. I went to the township, either Alan or I did, I forget who, and I said, can you transfer the taxes from the second lot to the first lot? Since I don't intend to develop it any time in the near future, do I have to continue to pay the taxes as I'm developing the property? The answer from the township was, no, we'll reduce your taxes. So they did. Thank you for that, by the way. So that's the kind of the sum and substance in the history of my relationship with Prop. Thank you.
any public comment? Hearing no public comment, we'll open for board discussion. I just want to state that um, I live on Hennepin Cove Road, and in the past that, you know, we live in the town, the issues don't come up for um, recusing ourselves, but uh, I live at the northern end of the town of the street. Um, I only know one person uh, in, in this audience here. Um, I'll defer to your good judgment whether you, I should recuse myself in this application. It doesn't sound like based on what you've said you should. I mean, do you feel like you can be impartial? Yes, I don't know either party or, or the okay. people who are speaking. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, board discussion. Anywhere. And are there any other background you want to provide or I mean no, you, you I, issued the permit. I I did. Okay. Um based on I, I issued the permit based on the planning board approval as well as Bruce Smith's letters that, that are in the file. Okay. So, Ben, in your view, the public access waiver was, was still valid? Yes. And Ben, in your view, you felt as though the, there was a, an arrangement to provide the long-term maintenance of the road? Uh, that was my understanding, based on the correspondence. I did not specifically review that or have the town attorney review that. So this, uh, the formal agreement for, well, that's right, legal, legal enforceable agreement for, for road maintenance, is that in our materials? I, I saw something related to that, but Attorney Shimadin is saying there it doesn't, that it's only part of it? I believe it is Exhibit 12. Uh, to the right. And that's an agreement that I think as Attorney Shimadat pointed out is signed uh, only by David Smith. Is that because at the time, um, David Smith was the only person on Cunner Lane? I'm not familiar with the layout down there as to whether there are other No, orders. the other the other properties were developed at the time, okay. most of them. It's interesting language in the ordinance. Uh, legally binding arrangements exist to provide for the long-term maintenance of the road. It does not necessarily say, it doesn't in fact say that every homeowner or property owner along that roadway needs to be party to a, a written agreement. Um, and I suspect Mr. Smith's argument would be that, well, I'm providing for guaranteeing access here. I'm providing a turnaround. This will be enforced if you look just at the basic terms and I'm just kind of glossing, glossing over it. But. So in, in the, that document, um, section one, that portion of Cunner Lane abutting the property, passable on foot and by motor vehicles, does that go all the way to where the new lot is? Based on the presentation of the parties, I, I think it probably does not. There is an additional portion. I think Attorney Schumann pointed out that there is an additional portion, a map attached to his Exhibit A. There's an additional portion of the road over which you need to travel to get to the public right away, where there are properties that whose owners have not signed on to this. This agreement does not bind them. 
but it doesn't bind David Smith to maintain it that far, even, even though it might be used by somebody else. I think it does. Yeah, section one states that portion of Cunner Lane abutting the property. So this says, you know, 21 Cunner Lane, is that the current residence, the current lot? No, the, no. the current lot, it was, it was talked about back then as 21, because that was the address of the parent lot, mm -hmm. but this was given 19 as an address. Okay, okay so the, this agreement covers the original lot, right, it was written back then, so now we're cutting, cutting into two lots. Does this apply to the budding the, the, you know, if it's supposed to be 21 and 19 together, does the fact that it doesn't say 19, is that, is that a problem? Yeah, I, I don't think 19 existed at the time of this agreement. I think it was all understood to be 21 as as, as described by Mr. Schumadine as well. I think it was accurately described. So this applies to both lots? Yes. I mean, it was 21, now it's both. Right. But 21 yeah. encompassed both lots at the time of this declaration. Yes. That, that appears to be the case. If you look at the schedules of the agreement, I'm not going to claim that I've done any extensive type of work on this or anything else, but if you look at the last paragraph, it does reference the fact that it applies to the property that was conveyed by um, the trust. It, where are we looking at? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's uh, Schedule A to the Road Maintenance Agreement. Which is, so it's Exhibit 12, Schedule A. Um, and it's the second page of that. I, I, again, it, it just... It just further verifies what, what Ben is suggesting, which is I think that uh, the agreement does apply to both of the properties that we're talking about here, or to the or to 20, 20, 20 and 21. While we are thinking about other matters, can we start with the issue of standing? I think they're standing. And that is not an issue? To, to me, there's not an issue. And I looked at this case, and this is, yes. doesn't say that there's not standing. And we've had a previous application dealing with an abutter uh, adjacent or diagonal and across the street, and that person, that homeowner, had uh, standing. Yeah, last month. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I Okay. I, I, I agree. I guess I'll go out on a limb here and start things off. I'm, I'm inclined to uh, to deny the, the appeal. Uh, it seems like we had uh, legitimate uh, 
forceful town action by the 1997 table with plan um, granting the public access waiver, um, getting into you know waiver and abandonment and estoppel issues sounds to me more like Superior Court terrain than Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals terrain. Um, it appears as though we do have a, what is a legally enforceable road maintenance agreement, at least for the portion of the road that abuts the subject property. Uh, from what I can see from the submissions, um, the town emergency services are content the condition and extent of the road as, as reviewed as, as reviewed by Ben, I think. Um, that's my inclination at the moment. Just to add to that, it just, do you think it's a little um, peculiar that there's an agreement for only a portion of that road? So it would be more inconsistent that the homeowner that owns that portion of the road would only require an agreement for the portion that he does not own? Is that right? I, I do. I, I agree. I think that's unusual. I don't think it's ideal. But when you look to the strict, plain language of the ordinance, it does, again, does not say that there it requires a legally binding arrangement that binds all of the abutting owners to that private road. That is omitted. And of course, the, the purpose of the legal binding arrangement is simply to provide access to the property, according to the ordinance. Right. There could be a situation where there's a developer puts in such a road and the developer is responsible from out of town even to come in and maintain it for the people who purchased from them. And to your point, emergency services and anybody Street else who access. needs to get into the, those properties presumably has the ability to do so by virtue of that agreement. Would appear to be so. Discussion, any thoughts contrary to Mike's kind of analysis? Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to agree with like, generally what Mike said. I guess there are two more, just because there were um, discussion on, these, on this particular point, is that um, the, the weight of the letter, um, I don't think I'm persuaded one way or the other about the particular use of the word abandon. Um, I, I thought there was a discussion, both, both counsel as well as um, Mr. Smith, and, and who got up there and, and discussed the letter. Um, so I'm not really, there is some weight to that letter, uh, Exhibit D, but not to the weight uh, that is being suggested by the applicant. I, I agree, I agree. We lawyer types, I think, see the word abandonment and, and the bells and whistles go off, but um, uh, that's just because we've become so jaded sometimes in our <laughs> interpretation of everything. Everything has to be the exact letter of the letter of the word and, and exact context. And I think that folks uh, commonly use those terms and, and don't always mean the Black's Law definition of the term abandoned. Um, I may also, I mean, would the board have the power to find that that letter constitutes a legally binding abandonment of the subdivision. I'm not sure. Well, maybe if there's additional conduct that removes right. doubt from the potential ambiguity. But, uh, yes. To me, with the, just the letter itself. 
Any other discussion? Thoughts? Um, so I'd like to make a motion. Sure. I would move to deny uh, the June 19th, 2015 appeal of Leslie Fismer with respect to building permit 150401. is to deny the administrative appeal of Leslie Fismer for building permit 150401 because the code enforcement officer did not err by approving this permit. Sounds like the motion. Perfect. Do I have a second? I'll second. Um, any discussion on this motion? I just have a little bit of a problem there in, in the sense that I'd almost want to qualify uh, the code enforcement officer did not here in approving this permit insofar as uh, it met the standards of section 19.7-9. Um, I'm uncomfortable getting into all the other issues which are really not interpretive of the provisions of the zone ordinance. I mean, I think So you're just saying since that was the section that was challenged? I'm simply saying that, that he was correct in, in, rely, in, in, in interpreting 19-7-9 in approving the permit. Um, I, I myself would prefer to be a little bit more general in our language and, and I guess I get a little nervous about referencing specific provisions within the ordinance. I know that's the context. I know that's how this is framed. Um, but I think it's better for purposes of, of making and keeping our record and our factual findings not to reference specific, specific ordinance provisions. I, I, I would agree in this case. It could create some confusion, I think, if this did end up as an appeal. Well, it's a question of, of whether or not we want to get into the whole notion of what Ben took into account other than 19.7-9. But not, I mean, the, and we've heard argument for why. And I'm not inclined to want to do so, so that's why I said Right, but I mean, we've heard, I mean, all, all we have is the argument that's before the board. And so nobody, there hasn't been a challenge with respect to the permit for other, you know, on other grounds or, or on other sections of the ordinance. So to, I, I'm just more comfortable keeping it broad because there has been argument that, well, there's also another section that shouldn't be issued under this other section. Um, okay. So. With, with that explanation, then I'm happy. All right. Um, any further discussion? Now, could we restate or repeat uh, the... Um, to deny the administrative appeal of Leslie Fismer for building permit 150401 because the code enforcement officer did not err by approving this permit. Passes five nothing. Um, I'll read these first three draft findings of fact, and if there's anything else I'd like to add, we can add that. Um, findings of fact number one: On May 22, 2015, the code enforcement officer approved building permit 150540. On May 22, 2015, the code enforcement officer approved building permit 150401 to construct a single family dwelling on a vacant lot at 19 Cunner Lane, tax map U14, lot 26-1. Two, on June 19, 2015, 
Leslie Fismer submitted an administrative appeal stating that the building permit 150401 violates the Town of Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance and therefore should be rescinded. Three, on February 18, 1997, the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board approved the creation of the subject lot based on section 19-4-2-B of the zoning ordinance in effect at that time. I have one amendment. Amendment, amendment or addition? Uh, it would be an amendment to number two. Okay. Um, we'll get to that in a oh, okay. second. That's that's the next item on oh, the agenda, and that's. Um, so after the word uh, violates, uh, I would include a particular reference to the ordinance section. Violates section 1979A of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Okay. So, number two will now read On June 19, 2015, Leslie Fismer submitted an administrative appeal stating that the building permit 150401 violates section 19 7 9A of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance and therefore should be rescinded. Um, any additional findings of that? Uh, hearing nothing, um, all in favor of those three findings of fact? All right, the findings of fact are approved. Three, uh, five. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next item, which is um, to hear the request of Joseph Waltman, representing Cunner Lane LLC, to appeal the Code Enforcement Officer's denial of the cupola portion of Building Permit 150401 at 19 Cunner Lane, map U14, lot 26-1. Okay. Um, so that appeal is withdrawn, um, and therefore the denial of the cupola portion of the building permit stands. Thank you. Um, moving on to item number three, which is to hear the request of Chris and Scotty Wellens for a variance to increase the building coverage on their lot of six, lot at six, Stony Brook Road, map three, lot 11, uh, 117, to 25.02% when the zoning ordinance only allows 25%. Images to just can I do that? If you have a place to plug it into, oh, I that was pre existing. <laughs> so I guess we live in Cornwall. What's that? We, I don't know. We don't have the right. other <laughs> system. Um, a little more. Before you get started, um, I think I was going to have Ben introduce this because I think there's a quirk in terms of the uh, applications. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> minor administrative error on my part noticing this. Uh, when I received this application and wrote the public notice, I overlooked the fact that th there's actually two appeals in this appeal. There is a variance and there's also the uh, reconstruction of a non-conforming structure. Uh, so in my notice, we noticed the abutters based on the fact that uh, their neighbor was applying for a variance to increase the building coverage on their lot. Uh, we did not notice the abutters that they are 
also reconstructing a, a non-conforming structure. That said, I, you know, a variance is a much stronger legal issue than, uh, than, the, than the reconstruction of a non-conforming structure. So I think you know, the, the more legally heavy application was noticed uh, to the abutters. Uh, as far as the reconstruction of the non-conforming structure, it's, uh, it's a very modest expansion of three feet uh, of the, uh, three feet of garage width. Um, the, the whole application revolves around expanding the garage width by three feet in order to be able to actually fit two cars in the garage reasonably. So that requires, and, and their lot was maxed out on the, ma on the maximum building coverage, so they need a variance to the maximum building coverage but the front of the garage is also within the front setback. So by expanding that three feet, they also are required to do an application to reconstruct a non-conforming structure without getting closer to the property line. So this is actually two applications bundled into one. The findings of fact reflect both applications bundled into one. Uh, but at the time of noticing this, uh, it, it was noticed as simply one item. Which is the variance. Which is the variance. Not the reconstruction of a non-conforming structure. That's right. Okay. And just to be clear, the non-conforming reconstruction, non-conforming use, it's not changing. The, sorry. The, the non-conforming structure, the purpose of that non-conforming structure is not changing. The garage is merely expanding three feet. That's correct. Thank you. So the only concern is that notice was not provided for the reconstruction of the non-conforming structure where it was provided for the variance. Yes. And have we received any objection or any public response or comment? I haven't received any public response to our noticing. And the, the, the people who would have standing to object would be the same people, whether it's a variance or non-conforming use. Right. Yeah. My only hesitation is that if I'm a neighbor and a butter and I get this in the mail, it says um, it's expanding 0.02%. Can't work on the numbers now, but the complete coverage is expanding 0.02% overall. Um, I'm not going to really object to that. I'm not going to notice it. But if I get a notice saying that there's a non-conforming, that they're reconstructing non-conforming, et cetera, et cetera, it even though it's the same thing, it just looks different, like a bigger deal. So it causes the neighbor to look into it more and not all of a sudden register an objection. I'm, I'm just saying, um, I don't want us to be in a situation where we get somebody later on saying, hey, there was a problem here. I mean, we saw come very recently how much animosity there was about expanding a, a house in the neighborhood next to this. So I'm just, just put it out there. That, that's a valid point. I, I do think the term variance has a little more weight, you know, legally and, and yeah. even with you know, common people in yeah. their neighborhoods. You know, people when people hear the term variance, I think it it does have a little more weight. And I and understand absolutely. The un yes, it does. But when the yeah. facts of it are 25 to 25.02, it yeah, it says, yeah. oh, it's a big deal. But yeah, and and the other consideration is that you know the variance is for the exact same thing. We're, we're, we're talking about the exact same thing. It's not like they put in two applications, one to expand their garage and the other to do an addition off the back and we forgot one. You know, both applications are for the exact. The, the expansion of that 0.02% yeah. is the same thing that requires the approval for reconstruction of a non conforming right. structure. So if someone inquired, you know, what is the variance for, what is the subject of the variance it would be? So, well, I mean, so, the, so the abutters are on notice of the work that is proposed right. for the garage, yeah. just yeah. not the one of the two legal requirements for approval 
mm -hmm. of Edward mm -hmm. by the zoning board. And I think based on that, I'm comfortable proceeding. Um, and I think, you know, if, if anybody was, the work that was being done, the neighbors are on notice of. Right. And kind of the legal technicalities of, of what was required, I'm less concerned about as just they were on notice that, you know, and, and they could have, you know, gone, you know, pulled the application and, and learned more about what was happening. Okay. Would you agree that the, this is a, a administrative irregularity that does not go to the substance? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And so, so based on that, unless anybody else on the board disagrees, I think we can hear the um, hear this matter. Um, I will note that I live on Stony Brook Road. Mike does as well. I, mean, I, I feel I can be impartial. Well, we would have a problem if we said no, and you'd have to yeah. accuse because we would not have a quorum. Yeah. Right. Well, it and might it, be two of us. And I, I know Dr. and Mrs. Wellens a little bit. <laughs> met a couple of times. And, <laughs> I don't feel like uh, there's any issue with me uh, being impartial. So let's close that just yeah. in case anybody wants to take issue with that. Okay. <laughs> Having said all that. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're here. Hi. Now you get to talk. And we're very grateful that you're willing to hear our, uh, whatever this is. Um, you stand behind the mic. Sorry. Oh, 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 yeah. So I'm Scotty, this is Chris, and we're very grateful that you're going to hear our um, proposal. We um, live at 6, 6 Stony Brook Road. We love our home. We have a two-car garage that is um, uncomfortably tight for us, and um, we are very anxious to preserve the aesthetic of our home, um, but we also would like to have a functional garage um, that we can get in and out of without damaging our cars and um, with a little bit more ease. So um, the situation, you can see here the picture. So this is the before and this is the after. As you can see, we're not making any sort of serious change. I find it difficult to tell, tell the two apart. Um, the, uh, the primary issue is that the space is so narrow that um, it's hard for us to open doors without hitting um, either the walls or the other car. And it's also so low that we have about a one inch clearance to pull our vehicle into the garage, my, my vehicle, the Subaru, into the garage. And um, so we can't have a rack on our car, for example. We have kayaks and we can't, we can't carry them and that sort of thing. So it's, it, and it's hard because our bikes and stuff are in the basement. We can't get them out unless we first move the cars. And it, so it's just an awkward space. The other um, issue and why this is coming to a head now is that the garage is, is leaking and um, it's not structurally sound. If, if it snows, we have to shovel it off, um, otherwise the garage door opener won't work because the roof starts to sag. Um, and there are some other, um, there's some joist issues which I don't pretend to fully understand and also the, the floor itself is pitched the wrong way. And, it's cracking, so there's, there, we decided that um, this was the time to fix the garage, and if we're gonna fix it, why don't we make it a little bit more functional? And so our proposal is to raise the garage by a couple of feet to more better accommodate the, um, my car and having a rack on it, and we also want to widen it by about three feet um, in order to be able to open our doors <laughs> and walk between the cars. So, I don't know if there's, do you think there's something else that we need to, to mention in particular, or we'd love to have questions, or? Oh, I get, well, I guess. Yes. I was just thinking. Uh, we do, we have talked this project over with all of our immediate neighbors, so on either side, and across the street, the Talbots and the Currys and the, Francins, and um, they've all provided letters that say um, we approved this project. They've seen the plans and they've signed off on it. And um... yeah, I mean, and I also see for the application for the reconstruction, um, 
you know, you guys did a helpful job of providing, you know, the justification, going over the size of the lot, slope of the land, potential for soil erosion, location of other structures, location of septic system, impact on views, type and amount of vegetation, and then for the application for the variance. Um, likewise, you attach to your application kind of the analysis, um, explain the scope of the work, and then why the need for the variance was due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. The granting of the variance will not produce any undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Um, and the practical difficulty is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. And he also helpfully attached a number of photographs of other uh, two-car garages in the neighborhood. Is your garage in there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just pointing that out. All right. I didn't see yours though. No, no, no. You omitted mine, but that's okay. I just walked up the stem. I didn't get that far on the stone. <laughs> Any questions? Um, no public comment because nobody's here and I, I will note again that um, as part of the record we have letters from the immediate budding um, homeowners or landowners um, who are expressing uh, no objection to this project. Uh, board discussion? Yes, uh, the variance standard is, is Pretty tough, but I think in, in this scenario, I think you, I, th I think we should properly grant the variance. Um, I think the property, the the lot is unique in the way it's laid out. Um, certainly, wouldn't the change wouldn't produce any undesirable change. In fact, the, the home, the external features of the home are very attractive aside from the garage. Um, so I think we'll probably improve the. Yeah, the area in that regard. Um, I think the other standards are met as well. And then as far as this kind of the second secondary piece that Ben had referenced, the fact that you have sort of two appeals in one, I think the application does a good job of addressing some of those concerns, as Josh mentioned. Uh, slope of land, size of law, uh, potential for soil erosion. Obviously none of that is in play with a very minor uh, expansion or extension of the garage. So I, I'd be in favor of the application. And, and also just to kind of belt and suspenders approach in terms of the notice that went out I mean, having these letters from the uh, abutting, you know, homeowners who are speaking about the project and you know, not objecting to the project makes me feel even more comfortable about the fact that, you know, anybody who might object to this is on notice and does not object. Just for the record, uh, you two live on the street. Would you consider yourselves a butters? No. no. I'm way on the other end. <laughs> I'm not as far, but not. I wouldn't consider myself that far. So we have, there are three letters um, as part of the application process that are in support of the application. Um, those are from the abutters on Stony Brook Road. And they mentioned the garage specifically? Yep. In size. Um, any further discussion? This is perhaps a chicken and the egg scenario. Um, which application will trump the other? So are we talking about the variance or are we talking about the non-conforming use application? At the same time? I think we just, I, I mean, we've, uh, Sorry, when we, uh, when we review it for purposes of approving the application itself. Well, I mean, the, um, I mean, the motion that I would suggest, because it was, suggested here would be to approve both the application to reconstruct the non-conforming garage and the variance to exceed the allowed maximum building coverage by 0.02%. And then, I mean, finding the fact cover both the requirements for the variance and the reconstruction. So it's kind of all packed in. I agree, I think if the motion wraps both them in and the findings address uh, the standards for both and in good shape. I agree. I think when they're 
You want to go ahead and make the motion, Jeff? Sure. Um, I would move to approve both the application to reconstruct the non-conforming garage and the variance to exceed the allowed maximum building coverage by 0.02 percent. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Okay. It's approved five nothing. Um, findings of fact. Uh, one, Chris and Scotty Wellens are the owners of record of the property located at 6 Stony Brook Road, map U03, lot 117. Two, the subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RC zone and it is connected to the public sewer. Three, the zoning ordinance section 19-4-3 allows the maximum building coverage of 25%. Four, the proposed reconstruction of the garage will create a maximum building coverage of 25.02%. Five, the proposed garage will increase in width by three feet. Six, the proposed garage will not further encroach into the front setback. Additional findings of fact. One, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Two, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. Three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Four, no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Five, the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. Six, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. Seven, the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system and other on-site soils suitable for septic system, the impact on views, and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. Eight, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure as it relates to the setback requirements. Nine, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. In conclusion, there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30 AM RSA section 4353 4C. All in favor of those findings and the conclusion? Approved five nothing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, any communications for the board? Have a motion to adjourn. So moved. We are adjourned. <laughs>